Okay, welcome to uh, chapter 14, nuclear power, talking about fission, commercial fission reactors, part two. There's the references again to the pages in the course textbook. And uh, as I mentioned previously, I'm going to be talking uh, <clears throat> about, well, to some degree about CANDU reactors, because that's the Canadian reactor. And in part one, we talked about history and a bit of the current status of nuclear power. We just started talking about the fundamental principles a little bit about fission. And so we're going to finish off talking about sort of the fundamental uh, operating principles of a nuclear reactor and then finish up with what I think is the, if you like, the Achilles heel, the, the, the weakest point of nuclear power is actually the uh, disposal of the spent fuel, which is high level nuclear waste. Okay, so carrying on about, this is about the physics of a nuclear reactor. In order to understand how a nuclear reactor works, we have to understand what happens to neutrons in the reactor. Uh, it's neutrons that maintain the uh, chain reaction, of course. Uh, a U-235 atom fissions spits out, <clears throat> on average, 2.4 neutrons and one of those has to go on to continue the chain reaction it has to hit another u-235 atom to split it and continue the, the chain reaction <coughs> excuse me so but it turns out that in addition so fission is one thing that can happen but the problem is is that you can have other things happen and one of them is elastic scattering another one is what's called radiative capture that's basically absorption of the neutron and then the last one is fission, which we've talked about. So yeah, we need to understand these three things to sort of understand the basic operation, operating principles of a nuclear reactor. So first, let's talk about elastic scattering. So a neutron comes out of the fission site. You know, the U-235 splits in two incredibly violently. The neutron comes out at enormous velocities, fractions of the uh, speed of light. And it collides with other atoms. It collides with, of course, uh, other uranium atoms. Now, when it's going super fast, it won't cause fission. So if it bumps into a uh, U-235 atom, it will not, or a U-238, which is what uh, uranium, natural uranium mostly is, it'll just bounce off. It's like a, a ball colliding on a billiard table. It just rebounds elastically. And in fact, what happens is it bounces around and it bounces around in the fuel rod and then eventually out into the, the coolant, which in a candy reactor is heavy water, and it hits the heavy water atoms and it bounces off of them. And that's how the neutron gets slowed down. That's the mechanism for taking high-speed neutron and converting it to a slow-speed neutron, which is the process of moderation. That's what the heavy water a candy reactor does and what the light water in uh, other worldwide reactors uh, do. But see, the fraction of energy when you have a collision, when a neutron strikes a, a nucleon, some other atom, the uh, amount of energy that's given up here and transferred and how slow this is on rebound depends upon the mass of this nucleus. If this is super massive, it's like throwing a ping pong ball against a billiard ball, the ping pong ball just rebound without losing much energy. But if two ping pong balls hit, um, you know, they sort of share, the, the energy gets split. And so it turns out that if this thermalization, taking a, a high-speed neutron and bringing it down to thermal levels, so basically it comes down to the level of the vibrating atoms in the, uh, in the moderator. So it becomes thermalizing is the process of slowing down a high-speed neutron until it it's just vibrating around, wandering around the reactor, looking for a U-235 to continue the chain reaction. If it if a high-speed neutron hits a hydrogen atom and every collision, it only takes 18 collisions. Of course, that would be incredibly rare for that to happen. Uh, if it hit U-238, which is a super heavy atom, it would take over 2,000 uh, collisions. And of course, it, any neutron probably encounters a range of materials but mostly uh, uranium and hydrogen and water, right? And so uh, 
it's not going to be, it's going to be somewhere between 18 and 2000 collisions to slow down the neutron until it can be slow enough to go and find another U-235 and uh, cause fission. And so that's why water is a good moderator. That's why H2O, which is light water, and D2O is a good moderator because hydrogen, even even heavy hydrogen, even deuterium, is is pretty light. It only has a, a atomic mass of two, right? And uh, hydrogen has an atomic mass of one. So it's uh, it's it's going to be light relative to a neutron. So it'll be very good at, at uh, thermalizing, at slowing down those high speed neutrons. That's why they use not all reactors use water. Uh, Canada uses heavy water. Some reactors use carbon. It's become, become a problem. We won't talk about. We won't get into those details. But mostly water and uh, heavy water and light water are used as the moderator to slow down the, the nuclei. So elastic scattering is one thing that can happen to, to a neutron. Uh, another thing that can happen is radiative capture. So in that case, the neutron, every once in a while, it when it strikes another another atom, it doesn't, another nucleus, it doesn't bounce off, it doesn't elastically scatter, it gets captured, it gets, it gets absorbed. That's that's another way to say it. It's, it's captured by the atom. An example here is a neutron coming along and finding a hydrogen atom, a heavy hydrogen deuterium in heavy water, and, you know, that neutron here gets absorbed, and it's called radiative capture because that excites the atom and it gives, it gives off a gamma ray, which is a source of radiation. But the thing is that this new uh, new atom here now is tritium. So that's how we can manufacture something that doesn't pretty much doesn't exist in the natural world. You bombard deuterium, heavy water, or the heavy heavy hydrogen and heavy water with neutrons in the reactor, and some of it turns into tritium, which is uh, radioactive. And so this is uh, uh, how we can produce radioactivity in the core. The, the, the product nucleus becomes a new isotope of, uh, of hydrogen. And if it struck an iron atom in the core, say it's found a little bit of a piece of iron in one of the tubes or something, and a neutron struck it and it got absorbed, it would become a, it would stay iron. It would still have the same number of protons, but it would have an extra neutron. It would become a, a synthetic isotope of uh, iron. And so that makes everything that's in the core of the reactor because of the neutron flux tends to absorb a neutron once in a while and become radioactive. That's called neutron activation. Uh, neutron activation is the fact that the, the atom absorbs a neutron and turns into an isotope of that, of that element. And that isotope is almost always unstable and radioactive. Yeah, so it's the it's one source of radioactivity in the core. We'll talk about some of the other sources. The fission product, the fission products are probably the main source. There, the two fragments of fission are, are isotopes that are usually radioactive. But other th other sources of radioactivity are things that are uh, induced radioactivity because of neutron flux creating isotopes. Yeah, so uh, radiative capture is a problem uh, if you have light water. Uh, light water, the, the, he the hydrogen in water likes to absorb neutrons. Deuterium doesn't so much. It's something like 600 times less absorbing of neutrons. And so uh, if you have light a light water reactor, so by light water I mean H2O, uh, it, it likes to absorb uh, neutrons, and in order to keep the chain reaction going, in order to have one of those 2.4 neutrons to survive, you have to enrich your fuel. You have to enrich your uranium to 3, 4, 5 percent. Otherwise, the neutron will have too low a chance of finding a U-235 atom before it gets absorbed. And so by using heavy water in a CANDU reactor, uh, the new, the fast neutrons bounce around in the heavy water and they don't get absorbed and they've got a uh, they've got a much longer lifespan more collisions before they get absorbed and so we can use uh, uh, natural uranium in the candy reactors because heavy water has a really low propensity to absorb neutrons and so there's or which is called radio radio it has a low 
propensity for radiative capture, which is the absorption of a neutron. A common error that people, uh, or a common misconception, people think that if something, you know, if you have, if something is in a radioactive, is exposed to radiation, it becomes radioactive itself. So if you have gamma rays from, say, you were getting undergoing cancer treatment and you had a gamma source to kill your to kill your tumor you would not become radioactive gamma rays are just light they just strip off electrons they kill the tumor we'll talk about the biological effects of, of uh, radiation later on so being exposed to radiation gamma radiation and alpha particles and things like that does not make you radioactive the exception is neutrons. If you get exposed to a neutron flux, and the only place that would happen would be in the core of a nuclear reactor, you could absorb neutrons, and that would turn some of your elements into isotopes that were radioactive. So uh, in general, radiation does not, ionizing radiation does not make you radioactive, but neutrons do. Neutrons, uh, neutrons in the core of the reactor do uh, create, uh, do activate things and make them make them into isotopes so yeah irradiating things like you know one way to to kill uh, to sterilize uh, medical instruments is to put them in a very high gamma field which would kill all the bacteria and viruses uh, which is fine it's a way to do that uh, and it does not make the instruments themselves radioactive so that's a that's kind of an important point okay so we've talked about elastic scattering the neutron bouncing off, and that's the that's the mechanism for moderation for slowing down neutrons. We talked about radiative capture, and uh, why that's why we use heavy water in nuclear reactors. And then, of course, the third one is that could possibly happen is fission, and we've talked about fission, where a, a low kinetic energy neutron gets absorbed by U two thirty five, and it makes the atom unstable. All of those uh, positive uh, protons nuclear force can't hold it together anymore and it rips apart because of the coulomb force and you get these two fission fragments and in this diagram i've corrected it I, my previous slide had a little error this is showing krypton and barium and three neutrons of course that's one possible split it's one of the common splits but it's it can split in many other ways and you can have all kinds of you know it can be a big one of these can be big and one of these can be small or almost any variation in between and you don't always get three neutrons. You could get anywhere between zero and five neutrons. On average, 2.4. And one of those neutrons has to survive in order to continue the chain reaction in a power reactor. And it's the kinetic energy of these uh, particles here that bump into the fuel, make it vibrate. And we, as you we should remember from the first part of the course, it's the uh, atomic and molecular vibrations. That it, that's what heat is. That's what thermal energy is. Yeah, so fission products, these it's not just krypton and barium, it's a spectrum of elements, and almost all of them are unstable and radioactive, meaning that they decay and they give off alpha and beta particles and gamma rays. So they're, they're quite dangerous, and they're super high kinetic energy. Yeah, so amazingly, a fresh fuel bundle, here's a lady holding a fresh can-do fuel bundle. I have done this myself. Uh, I worked in the fuel handling for a little while. That's a fresh fuel bundle straight from Cameco in uh, Port Hope. And it's just little, uh, you know, zircaloy tubes, special alloy that doesn't absorb neutrons, uh, with little ceramic pellets of uranium oxide. Uranium is not terribly radioactive by itself. It is a little bit, but not, not tremendously. So it's safe enough that you can hold it in your hands. But, it, when it's been in the reactor and it's and some of those uranium atoms have split, it creates a huge range of fission products. Uh, I mentioned a couple in the previous slide, but this is the fission yield versus atomic mass number. And you get, you don't always get uh, barium and krypton. You can get anything uh, over the entire, almost the entire uh, atomic range. It could split into a little particle and a big particle, or it could split half and half that sort of thing. And a lot of the fission products, the, by fission products, I mean these two particles. These two particles could be almost anything. They could be, uh, they, one could be iodine, which is liquid. 
at room temperatures. Another one could be xenon, which is a gas. It's a noble gas at room temperature. So going back, the fission products, so you set off with this thing full of ceramic, and when you, at the end of the day, when the, when the uh, fuel bundle is spent, when the uranium has been all fissioned, you have all kinds of stuff, weird stuff in there. You have iodine, strontium, xenon, you have liquids and gases and solids, and almost all of those uh, uh, fission products are unstable and radioactive. So the, yeah, and it becomes highly porous and a mix of, a wild mix of radioactive elements. And as a result, if you were to hold a spent fuel bundle like this for, oh, I would say less than a minute, you would receive a lethal dose of ionizing radiation. It would be enough to, uh, you probably wouldn't die right away, but you would die within a few days as your cells totally disintegrated from uh, all the radiation. We'll talk about the biological effects of radiation in an upcoming talk. So, yeah, so these spent fuel bundles, because of the fission products, have to uh, be isolated from the biosphere for the order of a thousand years or so. In addition, uh, the fission products are radioactive, and so they give off these super high-speed particles, alpha, beta particles, and gamma rays, and that generates heat. And so the fuel bundles are hot, even after they come out of the reactor, even though fission has stopped. Yeah. Oh, and this shows, this little picture here shows a, a, a spent fuel bundle in water, and it's not fiction. It actually, all, all the high-speed particles coming off the, the uh, rod, the spent fuel rod, make it glow blue. It's called Karankov radiation. It's super cool. I've seen it in, with my own eyes. Nowadays, in a post-9-11 world, they won't take the public into the fuel bay and spent fuel bay anymore. Yeah, that's what spent fuel looks like for, well, that's freshly out of the reactor. It's probably a few days out of the reactor or less. Okay, another issue with spent fuel, and I've alluded to this earlier, that the bomb, uh, I think it was the second bomb on Nagasaki, was a plutonium bomb. Where the heck does plutonium come from? Well, it turns out that one of the things that builds up in the fuel uh, is plutonium-239. Uh, so you set off with uranium oxide and you get all these fission products. And another thing you get is this plutonium-239, It's which is ideal bomb material. Your modern bombs, modern H-bombs are made using plutonium. You know, so yeah, plutonium-239, uh, fissile material. So it's, it's bomb-grade material. It's created... It's amazing. It's created from the non-fissile. Remember, U-235 is the fissile component and U-238 is a non-fissile component. Well, when the non-fissile U-238 captures a neutron, this would be called radiative capture, it becomes, notice it captures a neutron. It doesn't change the number of protons. It gets an extra neutron here. So it becomes 239. Now, it turns out that that's unstable, that U-239, and it decays to something called neptunium, by a beta particle, that's a high-speed electron, and of course some gamma rays. So every 24 minutes, half of this newly produced uh, U239 decays to neptunium, and then the neptunium in another little, another about an hour or so, a little under an hour, decays to plutonium 239 by beta decay. And plutonium-239 is kind of ideal bomb material. It turns out it's better than U-235 for making a bomb. And the, the bomb in Nagasaki, the second bomb dropped on human beings in Japan in Second World War II was a plutonium bomb. Turns out that you don't need as much of it. It's a much smaller critical mass to make a bomb. So there's some, there's some substantial advantages to plutonium. And modern bombs are made out of plutonium. So that tells you that you got to keep uh, spent fuel rods away from, uh, uh, well, terrorists and rogue nations and things like that. And that's the issue of nuclear proliferation. So, yeah, what's happened here is basically the non-fissile, the, non, the non-fissionable component of uranium has been converted to a fissionable element, plutonium. And for that reason, U-235 is referred to as fertile. There are other elements that are fertile as well, like yeah, and it builds up 
quite a bit of plutonium builds up and it actually fissions and it produces about a third of the power. So U-235 produces two thirds of the power and fission builds up over the three years that the bundle spends in the reactor. And uh, it produces about a third of the power. It's so about a third of the electricity from a nuclear power plant comes from plutonium, which is pretty odd. Uh, this is such a, uh, I don't know what you could say, um, well, infamous material because of its relationship to bombs. So yeah, talking about plutonium production still. So if you have a fresh fuel bundle, you should know it's 0.7% U-235, well, 0.72 here, and that'd be 99.3% U-238. And then, so that's fresh when it comes from uh, the plant that makes them, that's in Cameco, and it makes the, the uranium oxide in Port Hope, Ontario. And uh, when it comes out of the reactor three years later, it, you know, the, the, some of, a lot of the uranium-235 has been fissioned and plutonium has also built up. And that's the issue. That is a, it's an issue on, on a number of levels. One is that it has an enormous half-life, 24,300 years. So uh, you're going to have to keep that in isolation for a long time considering that, you know, humans have really only had civilization for maybe 10,000 years. That's longer than humans have really been, at, and modern humans have, uh, modern human civilization anyway. So yeah, it's a serious problem for uh, uh, fuel disposal. It's considered high-level nuclear waste. It's, it's an issue regarding nuclear proliferation. You don't want, uh, you know, the wrong people to get their hands on it. Plutonium can be used to make a uh, fission bomb. It can also be used as a trigger for a fusion bomb, a hydrogen bomb. That's how modern hydrogen bombs work. Those, they're thousands of times more powerful than the ones dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, and I mentioned that the, the Nagasaki Fat Man bomb was a plutonium bomb. Have a look at the sidebar in the textbook talking about nuclear proliferation, page four. 82, uh, that sidebar talks about the situation in the Ukraine. It's a, probably a little old now, but where when uh, Ukraine inherited uh, 1,800 warheads from the former Soviet Union, and there's issues about, you know, the security of those warheads. There's also concern that uh, North Korea has uh, is developing uh, nuclear weapons and has enough plutonium from uh, to uh, build several bombs. Okay, so in a in a reactor, I mentioned you have one neutron going on to continue the chain reaction. Uh, so as I mentioned, you get between every fission, you get between zero and five on average, two point four neutrons per per fission event. And in theory, if you didn't have any absorption of the of the neutrons, you know, one neutron uh, could s strike a, 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 an atom fission. It would produce, uh, you know, uh, two more fissions and four fissions and eight fissions, or in fact, a little bit more because we have two point four three. It'd be a runaway chain reaction. So in a in a, a an atomic bomb, that's what happens, right? You you produce a couple of neutrons, it's actually 2.4. Those can go on and cause two and four and eight. With that kind of exponential growth, it doesn't take very many cycles before you uh, have an enormous uh, explosion on your hands. So the un that this sort of describes an unchecked uh, chain reaction, the kind you get in a fission bomb. So how do we present, prevent this? Well, we, we need to absorb some neutrons, of course. We don't, want, we don't want two to survive from each. We want exactly one to survive. This brings up a, another common issue that people are worried about. Can a fission reactor explode like a nuclear bomb? Is it possible that, uh, for example, Pickering, uh, one of the reactors at Pickering could uh, become a mushroom cloud? Have a pause if you're, if you're not looking at the slides directly. What do you think? Do you think that's possible? Okay, here's the answer. The answer is no. And the reason is because can-do reactors, 
even other reactors around the world that only enrich to 3%. But can do reactors don't use enriched fuel. They use 0.72 U-235. There's no way you can get a runaway chain reaction that would produce uh, this kind of explosion. Uh, atomic bombs are enriched to 90% plus. So you could have, uh, you know, well, we'll talk about the kind of accidents you can have, but you can't have a, you know, a mushroom cloud over uh, Pickering. So uh, that's a seems to be a common fear. Now, I guess not not surprisingly, given its connection, given the connection of nuclear power to nuclear bombs. So we don't have this going on in a power reactor. We don't have two, four, eight, etc. In a power reactor, we insert some absorbing material, some control rods that make sure that exactly one neutron from each fission goes on to cause another fission. And that keeps the power constant. Yeah, and it's, they're called control rods and they absorb 1.4 of the 2.4 uh, neutrons in the reactor. They, I've got a picture here in pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors. They look like this. This is the, the pressure vessel that we showed you before. And what they have is they have a hole through the top and uh, these rods get driven. And this is a, a control rod. It's made of absorbing materials, things like boron and cadmium that just, they, they, they absorb neutrons like crazy. They've got a huge propensity for radiative capture. We talked about radiative capture a few minutes ago where an atom gets absorbed, a neutron gets absorbed and it makes, makes the element turn into an isotope. So it, they absorb they absorb neutrons and you can, there's a sort of a motor that drives them in and out and you drive them in and out and there's a, a detector that detects the flux level and you adjust them until the neutron flux level is constant and you get constant power. So the number of fissions per second in, is not a runaway thing in a nuclear reactor. It's a, it's a constant, so that you get constant power. In a candy reactor, it looks similar, right? There's a candy reactor with all the pressure tubes. Uh, <clears throat> and they have control rods that go in between the pressure tubes. They're in the unpressurized, what's called the calandria, in the heavy, unpressurized heavy water. And they're, they're on little motors and they go up and down. Uh, so they pass through, they pass between the pressure tubes. Uh, there's extra rods up here that are super absorbing that are held up above the reactor and they're on a break, sort of a, a break that's being held, op held closed so that rods don't fall by electricity. And so if you have a power failure, uh, the break disengages and many, many, I've forgotten how many, like 20 or 30 absorbing neutron absorbing rods fall into the reactor and shut the reactor down. So, but if something uh, emergency weird, something happened, maybe you got all these tubes bent and the rods can't fall in, they have a, what's called STS-2, shutdown system two. This is the, this is actually the Pickering reactor. There's, some of the others have even fancier STS-2s. But what, what happens in uh, Pickering, if you, if, if STS-1, these shutoff rods that fall in under gravity, don't shut down the reactor fast enough, there's uh, some valves or there's actually a diaphragm here. And I think they, they blow these diaphragms explosively and the moderator drains out into this tank. And so you lose the moderator that's around all these tubes. You still have coolant flowing down the tubes, but all the moderator that's around the, uh, uh, the fuel uh, goes down to this tank down here. So if you lose the moderator, how would moderator dump, as I called it, dumping the moderator into this tank, how would that stop the chain reaction? Think about that for a minute. If you want to pause the video. So the answer is, is that you should remember that fast neutrons do not cause fission. You have to slow the neutrons down. The neutrons are slowed down by collisions in the heavy water. And if you lose most of the heavy water out of the reactor by this moderator dump, if it all drains into this tank, there's not enough heavy water in the reactor to slow down the neutrons and that, that stops the chain reaction. So there's a number of very, very nice safety systems in the CANDU system. One of the really, really big problems with nuclear reactors is what's called fission product decay heat. And it's been the cause of, uh, I don't know about all the accidents, but many of the accidents are related to this. Uh, 
it has to do with what happens as, with the power level when you shut down the reactor. SCRAM is it's kind of a U.S. term. I think it stands for subcritical reactor activation mechanism. It sounds like you want to run, right? But what it is is it, it refers to an automatic shutdown of the reactor. So if something goes wrong, like maybe a flux detector goes in the reactor or some piece of equipment that you can't operate the reactor without starts to misbehave, you could trigger just it's like triggering a breaker on uh, in your house you know to stop the electrical flow so uh, a breaker triggers or it's the reactor scrams and all those shut off rods fall in and uh, you know it's something that happens not at, not every day but fairly often in the reactor and uh, you know it's something it's just a safety feature it's something like tripping a breaker in your house or blowing a fuse it's not something you want to have happen all the time but it's a, it's a safety feature. And so when that happens, neutron absorbing shutoff rods fall into the reactor and the neutron population goes away because the uh, rods are super absorbing. They're cadmium and, and, and uh, boron. They're very high radiative capture of neutrons. And so what happens? This is the fraction of full power versus time. Notice this is a log scale. So that's one second, 10 seconds, 100 seconds, all the way up to, you know, whatever they were, 10,000 seconds. And so at full, when the reactor's running at full power, that's around 3,000 or 3,400 megawatts of thermal because you're converting about a third of it to electricity. And then at time zero, the sh here, the shutoff rods fall in. And what happens is the, the total power drops very rapidly and the neutrons all go away but you don't lose all of the heat. The fuel continues to generate heat. Now, why? What is fission product decay heat? Well, as I mentioned, all the fuel has, uh, well, it's no longer uranium. It's a bunch of mix of elements and they're all radioactive and they're all emitting alpha and beta particles and gamma rays. And those are being emitted at high energy. They jiggle the fuel they cause vibrations, and vibrations are heat. That's what vibrations are. They, they're, 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 they are the, that is what thermal energy is. And so even, so one minute after the control, the shutoff rods fall in, the neutron population goes to zero. You have no more fission going on, but all the radioactive decay products, all those fission products are decaying to other elements, uh, giving off uh alpha and beta particles, and that gives off a lot of heat. That represents about 7% of the power, and that goes away very, very slowly. After about a minute, almost all of the power is from uh, fission product decay heat. And so you got to continue to cool the reactor. Uh, you can't fundamentally, it's kind of like a kettle that you can't unplug. That's how uh, environmental groups would describe fission product decay heat. You can't you can't stop the generate. You can't stop the reactor from generating heat. Yeah. So after one minute from shutdown, there's no uh, fission. Decay heat constitutes a hundred percent of the thermal power. This fission product decay heat is from the decay of the radioactive elements, the fission products. Uh, you know, the iodine, the uh, strontium, uh, the xenon, everything that's in the in the uh, fuel rods, all those fission products that are giving off alpha, beta, and gamma rays. Remember, these are super high energy uh, particles and, and light, and that generates heat. That vibrates the atoms and creates thermal power. Even after one, uh, one day, the reactor power only drops to 1%. 1% doesn't sound much, but that's 34 megawatts. Think about your toaster. Your toaster produces about a kilowatt. So this is like 34,000 toasters, right? <laughs> yeah, be, of heat being produced that you have to cool. If you don't, if you don't cool it, the fuel is going to heat up and it's going to melt and it's going to, you're going to have a meltdown. That's what a meltdown is. So fission product decay heat is a super critical safety issue that you have to maintain core cooling for days and weeks and months after the reactor shut down. It's, if you don't, you're going to have a meltdown. And if you don't, the accident will be called a loss of coolant accident, a LOCA. That's what happened at Three Mile Island. That's what happened at Fukushima, right? They had an earthquake and a tidal wave came in and 
shut down their emergency generators so they couldn't keep the pumps running to cool the reactor and the reactor has had a partial meltdown. It's called a loca loss of coolant accident. That's all because of fission product decay heat. Now, the good thing is reactors under have emergency core cooling systems that under normal circumstances work very well. Uh, then they provide uh, cooling in accidental situations, but every once in a while they do fail, like in Fukushima. They should have put the uh, electric generators higher up above the uh, uh, where the tsunami couldn't get at it. That's why I have a picture of uh, of the Fukushima epicenter in uh, Japan here. They had a, they they had a number of reactors that experienced a loca, a loss of coolant accident. Yeah, it's, okay, so I've talked about spent fuel. Spent fuel is high-level waste. A fuel bundle spends about three years in the reactor before uh, all the uranium is fissioned. Of course, there's plutonium in there at the end as well. And th when they come out of the reactor, they're super radioactive. They've got to be cooled. A single fuel bundle, one of these things, are about the size of a log. Uh, they initially generate about 10 kilowatts. That's about 10 toasters plugged in on max. And, of course, over the course of a year, uh, they cool down. They, they become less radioactive. Uh, and they drop to about 100 watts. So you're talking about these things require cooling. And what happens is they get put in a, a, a very deep, like 30, 40 foot uh, uh, swimming pool. Not really a swimming pool, of course, but a water bay to cool for the first few years. After a few years in this water pool, they get transferred. They're, they don't generate much heat. They get transferred to above ground casks. This is, I can tell this is at Bruce because you can see the heavy water towers here. Those are the heavy water uh, chemical process that was used to extract the heavy water from the lake for, to make the heavy water. And so these are, uh, that's where a lot of the fuel is right now. It's considered temporary that we would store them above ground. As I mentioned, they're not the kind of thing that you want to have in the biosphere, and we need to keep them safe from uh, terrorists and rogue nations and uh, natural disasters and things like that. Um, yeah, so it's considered temporary. And there are plans, I've got a little video coming up, to uh, have a facility in somewhere in Ontario to store high-level nuclear waste, probably... And I'm hoping in, uh, basically, it'll be a specially designed mine in the um, uh, Canadian Shield. It's called, the concept's called deep geological storage. Yeah, so waste disposable, sorry, waste disposal is, I think, arguably the most critical issue facing the nuclear industry. Right now, Canada has, well, this is in 2016. It'd be similar. It might be seven hockey rinks, eight hockey rinks. So yeah, Canada has about enough spent fuel to fill uh, seven hockey rinks to the top of the board. So you get the sense of how big that is. Not terribly big. It's not enormous volume, but uh, I love how Canadian that is. Seven hockey rinks. That's the Canadian Nuclear Association. And each 1,000 megawatt plant roughly produces about two cubic meters of high-level spent fuel per year. That's about the size of a, of a decent uh, desk, of a, you know, an office desk every year. It's super radioactive. It's considered high level. That's what's high level radioactive waste. You hear environmental groups say it has to be isolated from the biosphere for 20,000 or 30,000 years. That's not true. It's of the order of a thousand years. This is the radioactivity versus time. This is again, not a linear scale. This is a log scale one year, a thousand years. This is the rundown of how many of radioactive. Remember Curie's after uh, Madame Curie uh, discovered the radi uh, radioactivity of radium. This is how many Curie's in a bundle over time. So we set off an enormous level at time zero and after a thousand years, it's dropped by about 10,000, a factor of 10,000. You could, after a thousand years, you could, Again, you could pick up a fuel bundle in your hands. It'd be, it wouldn't be uh, instant death like it is when it first comes out of the fuel bundle. Nevertheless, we have this issue of plutonium. There would still be plutonium in the bundle, which could be used to make bombs. And so you've got to isolate it, not just from the environment, but from access 
from uh, you know perhaps terrorist groups and rogue nations and anyone who might want to build a nuclear weapon. Canada does have a plan. It's our plan for for disposal of uh, long of uh, high level waste. The spent fuel is being handled by the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Uh, our plan, and I'll show you in a minute. Most other countries, their plan is what's called deep geological storage. They're building what are called DGRs, deep geological repositories. Anti-nuclear people call them dumps. No nuke dump here. No, we call it a nuclear repository. Uh, yeah, the site hasn't been chosen. It's There's been a lot in the news lately about possibly they're, they're coming close. There's been money set aside. So 1% of the revenue generated from nuclear has been nuclear energy has been set aside by all the provinces, mainly Ontario, uh, to cover the long-term costs. It's not considered enough, I would add. Uh, and like many issues uh, associated with nuclear power, public fear, some of which I think is irrational, maybe I'm being exaggerating by saying it's largely, some of the fear, which is based on lack of knowledge, uh, is, uh, uh, is irrational, that's for sure. Because I took a quote. This is from even 1998 uh, Nuclear Waste Management Report. This is a quote. The plan for deep geological de uh, disposal is technically sound and nuclear waste would be safely isolated from the biosphere, but it remains a socially unacceptable plan in Canada. Both socially and, uh, of course, a lot of the places we're planning on putting them are First Nations uh, land, and that's a, a, po a huge political issue. So it turns into... NIMBY and NIMTO. NIMBY is not in my backyard. Nobody wants to live near one. Well, that's not completely true. People who are comfortable with nuclear power, like near uh, nuclear plants, they're more comfortable with having a nuclear uh, repository. And NIMTO is not in my term of office. That refers to politicians that don't have the guts to do the right thing. Oh, why do I show this pop can down here? Well, that's because uh, that's about how much, you know, we get a lot of our electricity in Ontario from nuclear and your entire, if your entire lifetime needs of electricity were produced by nuclear, that's about how much spent fuel you'd be uh, responsible for about a, about the size of a Coke can. So it's pretty, the, the good news about nuclear waste is it's actually fairly compact. You know, you think about the, the waste from coal, it's all just distributed everywhere. We breathe it in every day from the United States. Whereas nuclear waste is at least compact, even though it's got enormous uh, issues associated with it. And there's been protests. This protest here is actually about a, a medium and uh, low-level nuclear waste uh, dump repository planned in Concordon, Ontario. It's got community support because uh, the people in Concordon and Port Elgin and, uh, on, uh, uh, that work at Bruce Power are quite comfortable and knowledgeable about nuclear and that seems to be the way that this nuclear uh, repository is going to go. Is It's going to go somewhere where people uh, are going to get an economic benefit and where people are a little bit more comfortable with nuclear power. That's what's happening in Finland. I've got a slide coming up in a few minutes. So yeah, the current plan is this thing, deep geological storage. Uh, it's basically a mine going down half a kilometer. Uh, it's going to be expensive, <laughs> billions and billions of dollars. Uh, it's likely, I hope, in the Canadian Shield, which is really low permeability. The big thing is you got to keep it away from groundwater. So really low permeability rock that's granite. It's going to be a multi-barrier system. So the fuel bundle will be put in some cask, some steel cask, which will be put in some absorbent bentonite clay. It's a multi-barrier system. And it'll be, of course, it'll be, it'll be monitored and it'll be retrievable. You'll hear, a, I've got a video coming up in a minute someone complaining about us uh, not giving future generations the option to do something about nuclear waste if uh, better options come up. But there, the current plan is that the nuclear waste would be retrievable, so we, we wouldn't be closing any doors to future options. The site will depend upon geology, social factors, any, well, it could be any time this year. I've been seeing discussions of, of potential sites. Uh, I'll play a video in a minute. And uh, it'll take time to build this and get all the and transport all the nuclear fuel there. But there's there's a plan, so that's the good news. 
So here I have a little video. This is an update, pretty much in the news, hot off the press, uh, maybe a, less than a year old, about uh, from Global News about what's going on with Canada's uh, nuclear waste. Play, a final resting place for something that refuses to die, radioactive nuclear fuel. Bentonite's a swelling clay. It is one part of a multi-barrier enterprise from Canada's nuclear energy producers that includes carbon steel containers to bury the most dangerous nuclear waste in a deep geologic repository that can withstand even the next ice age. Kilometers worth of ice, this needs to be able to withstand those, those forces. Why do it? because half a century of nuclear energy has produced thousands of tons of highly radioactive waste with no plan on what to do with it. Much of it sits in wet storage for up to 10 years. Then it goes here, dry storage, massive concrete and steel containers that are growing in number every week. Doing nothing is not an option. The plan by Canada's Nuclear Waste Management Organization is deep burial, a proposal that has Ottawa's backing. We have to do something. The, the waste is there and we have to, to, to do something uh, to protect future generations. Here is the picture of Canada's nuclear waste storage. 90% of Canada's radioactive used fuel is stored temporarily at the three big nuclear plants in Ontario. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization has narrowed to five communities in northern and southwestern Ontario that are considering hosting the repository to where the waste would be transported. The site would have surface facilities, elevators and infrastructure going down half a kilometer or more, and a huge repository, two kilometers by three kilometers, with hundreds of placement rooms. So, here we are, deep underground. Robotic equipment will move those bentonite clay boxes. Multiple barriers are designed to contain the radioactivity, first in ceramic fuel pellets, 30 or more in a tube, collected in fuel bundles. The bundles will be encased in thick carbon steel containers and then placed in the bentonite clay. The boxes will be stacked and packed into placement rooms. Canada has almost three million nuclear fuel bundles. There will be room for more than five million down here. The NWMO is already drilling boreholes in northern Ontario. The granite of the Canadian Shield may be an ideal container for nuclear waste. But for critics, it's all wrong to move waste from temporary storage to what would eventually be a sealed-off repository. The fear is a decision today that can't be undone by technology tomorrow. What we should not do is foreclose on future generations' opportunity to do better. But the engineering is moving forward from robotics to handle the waste to a mock-up of the underground storage. The NWMO says this generation is obliged to deal with the waste it has created. We are the generations that is benefiting from, uh, nucle from nuclear. We have the obligation to find the long-term solution. But it is a heavy decision to make, which, if it goes forward, will change one community forever. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Oakville, Ontario. Okay, so that's a really nice summary of uh, where we stand. I <laughs> love the media saying we have no plan. The plan's been in the works for the last 20 years, and now it's coming to fruition. And to comment on that one lady's comment about future generations, it will be sealed off, yes, to protect it from, uh, uh, you know, you don't want bad people getting at those nuclear fuel bundles that has plutonium in it, but it will be accessible should we come up with a better way to uh, deal with uh, uh, nuclear waste? Because this waste is going to be around for a long time. We're talking about a thousand years before it uh, becomes uh, uh, radiologically safe, reasonably safe anyway. Yeah, so this is a figure from your book uh, showing the world and all the uh, their plans for nu high-level nuclear waste. <laughs> I took this little graphic from uh, some anti-nuclear site earth being upset that we're dumping radioactive waste into it um and it shows yeah canada's plan is to for deep geological storage pretty much everywhere in the world some places are looking at salt mines uh germany is reprocessing their fuel and bonding it with glass it's called vitri vitrification where you mix the high level fuel with the glass so that it's kind of uh, you know it's really isolated and can't get washed into the water table and so, uh, yeah, geological storage in any case is, seems to be the solution. You might think, well, why can't we just fire this stuff into the sun or something? Well, it's just too heavy. It takes too much energy and there's safety issues. 
this seems to be this seems to be the uh, the solution that pretty much every country is coming to. Uh, this spent fuel repository, which is uh, Onkalo, Onkalo means uh, cavity in Finnish. This is probably going to be the first sort of uh, completed uh, high-level nuclear repository in the world. There's a lot of them under construction, but this one was it was under construction. I haven't checked on it lately. It's probably done now. Pretty expensive. It'll isolate the uh, fuel, you know, expected to isolate it from the groundwater for 10,000 years. And this is in uh, in Finland here. And they gave the community veto rights. Uh, and they asked a number of communities who would like to have it. And, of course, one of the communities that wanted it was where existing nuclear reactors uh, were already present and people were relatively comfortable with uh, uh, nuclear power. So that seems to be one of the solutions to, you know, this one of the social solutions to finding a home for, uh, for high-level nuclear waste. And it's very much a similar, similar kind of uh, plan in terms of storing it in a multi-barrier system uh, underground. Of course, wherever we pick to put that nuclear fuel, we're going to have to transport it. And that's one of the big issues is the safety during transport. And people are going to be freaked out about it. But there has been a, a nice bit of engineering testing. This was done quite a long time ago, actually, uh, now, uh, where they tested these casks where you could put spent fuel in. And they drove uh, full-size trucks into into solid cement walls at 80 kilometers and 80 miles an hour and they had here's another one being hit by a full-scale locomotive so the technology's there we figured out how to uh, transport high-level nuclear waste and we pretty much have in my opinion as a mechanical engineer uh, informed about these things we we have a pretty good handle on uh, uh, high-level nuclear waste storage in uh, in canada at least And that completes uh, part two. Uh, yeah, have a look at problem set number 10. I'm going to do another presentation on the biological effects of radiation, but that's a different chapter. That's chapter 15. I'm just going to do a little short thing on it. So have a look at problem set number 10 on uh, nuclear energy. Bye for now.